In 2002, the BBC conducted a poll naming the 100 greatest Britons that ever lived. Second to Winston Churchill was Isambard Kingdom Brunel, the greatest engineer in British history and world famous. But Isambard would not be a great British hero if it were not for his father's migration from France in 1799. And Isambard's talent and fame should in no way overshadow his father, as Mark Brunel was a successful engineer in his own right and played a vital role in shaping the city of London as we know it today. Without Mark Brunel's immigration to England, not only would we have been deprived of one of the greatest Britons that had ever lived, but our industrious capital city would be a very different place. Born in Hackville, Normandy, in France, in 1769, Mark Brunel began life on a farm, a world away from Victorian London where he'd live out his days. As the second son, tradition dictated he joined the church, but with a skill for drawing and a hobby of taking machines apart, it was apparent the young Brunel's passions did not lie with the gods. An uncle had connections in the Navy and arranged for him to be apprenticed, I suppose you would say, uh, in the Navy. In England, if you wanted to be an engineer, then you'd join the army. And the forces in France were also a route to technical expertise and training. To set himself firmly on the path towards becoming an engineer, Mark spent six years in the Navy. But he had a big idea, and his big idea was to automate production of the pulley blocks that the sailing ships of the time used to hoist sail up and down. And they're all made by hand. If he wanted to automate production, the best place to take that idea, his big million dollar making idea, was England, because at the time we had the biggest navy in the world, so this was where his custom would be. He met some diplomats, he met some English diplomats, he talked to them about his idea, and with an idea to make money, he came to this country. When Marc Brunel was in France, uh, he, he met an English family, and they had a governess, and as well as having an idea to make money, had an idea to find Sophia Kingdom the pretty English governess. So it was love as well as money that brought him to this country. Both of Mark's pursuits in England proved to be successful. He tracked down the pretty Sophia Kingdom and they married, a marriage which produced three children. Most notably, baby number three, Isambard Kingdom Brunel. Mark's pulley block system was indeed taken up by the Royal Navy and was a huge success, revolutionising the way the Navy worked. Mark also undertook many other successful projects. The traffic jam is, is not a, a modern problem and London has had congested streets for hundreds of years. And it was acute along the river. The river was crowded. Ships would arrive. There were 3,000 ships, 3,000 tall masted ships in the river every day. There were 10,000 little boats in the River Thames every day. Moving cargo from one side of the river to another was a huge problem, as the ships had tall masts and the frequency in which they passed meant bridges would have to be raised constantly, therefore backing up even more traffic on land. Mark Brunel's solution was to go under the river, not over. A simple and perhaps obvious idea now, but in those days a successful tunnel had never been dug under a river. This was a big deal. What makes the job very difficult is the nature of the soil. And south of the river, it's mostly sand and gravel. And sand and gravel and water makes quicksand. In order to combat the quicksand problem, Mark needed to come up with a whole new way of tunnelling. But Mark Brunel was a clever man. He designed uh, a huge cage. And here, do you see, is the miner's cage, a cage with 36 compartments, each one the size of a man. Each man or miner 
had a wall of planks dug to four inches, which is about the size of a brick, replaced the plank and took out the one below and dug to four inches, replaced the plank and took out the one below. And when he's done the whole of the wall and the man above and below have done the same, pushing against what's been built already, they move forwards, then the brick layers working behind them build the tunnel walls. And this is the only way that you can dig through soft earth. Inside a protective cage, so it doesn't cave in on you, moving forwards as you dig through the soft earth and as you move forwards, building the walls behind you. Mark's idea was accepted and plans for the tunnel were made. It would begin south of the river at a site in Rotherhithe and surface in Wapping on the north bank of the Thames. But after witnessing a failed attempt at a tunnel already, the public, although enthusiastic about a solution to congestion, remained sceptical. The fact Mark was a Frenchman did not help his cause either. So Mark begins here in 1825 um, with, with catcalls, actually, with catcalls and barracking, because he's French and he's aided by his son, uh, who's uh, Isambard Kingdom Brunel, who's half French, probably completely French as far as the locals are concerned, and they arrive here with the intention, the expressed intention, of building a tunnel. And what do they do? Well, the first thing they do is they build a tower. So you can imagine the kind of ribald comments. Uh, you may call yourselves engineers in France, but in this country, all our tunnels are below the ground. You're going the wrong way. Do you know what you're doing? Are you capable? This kind of barracking went on from the beginning of, of the project. But this new idea worked perfectly. A shaft 50 feet in diameter, 50 feet deep and weighing a thousand tonnes was built above ground and sunk into the soft earth below, creating a perfect entrance for the tunnel to be built underneath. This huge underground amphitheatre is directly above the tunnel that passes in this direction, north-south, under the River Thames. Brunel was the first to understand the best way to build below the ground is to build above the ground and sink it. So where we're standing now was once above ground. Despite the shaft being a success and a good start to the tunnel's construction, as with all large-scale projects, it was not plain sailing. There were all kinds of big problems and little problems and it was stressful and Mark uh, suffered a stroke. And when Mark was ill, when Mark was taken ill, then Isambard, uh, his son, Isambard, King of Brunel, took over as resident engineer. This is where he cut his teeth. This is where our most famous engineer actually began under his father's careful tutelage. And he was utterly keen. He's, um, he's 19 years old and he has everything to prove. He's so keen that he sleeps on the workers' platform in the tunnel beneath the River Thames, which I think is beyond the call of duty. Despite the enthusiasm and young talent of Isambard and the ingenuity and experience of Mark, the tunnel's construction was blighted by more problems and support began to wane. The much sought after prospect of easing London's congestion was beginning to be outweighed by the troubles in the tunnel. Mark Brunel thought it would take three years. It actually took 18 years and there were always problems. The working conditions are appalling. Unfortunately, the wooden planks kept back the soft earth, but not the water. So the poor men working in these cages under the river were showered with Thames water from the beginning to the end of their shift. And that would be unpleasant today, but in 1825, when the Thames was basically a, an open sewer, it was just indescribable. They were working in the semi-darkness and they were showered with effluent. And they're not just dodging sewage, they're dodging flames because they're digging through what was recently marsh. And when you get marsh and rotting vegetation, you get marsh gas or methane. 
And the miners have oil lamps, and the oil lamps ignite the methane so that there are tons of flames shooting from the cages whilst they're trying to dig under the river. And they only work for two-hour shifts, not because the company is magnanimous, but because after two hours they collapse. With construction going over its predicted duration, the money was running out. To make things worse, the tunnel had then flooded. A huge amount of money was spent in plugging the hole and pumping the tunnel dry. But then, of course, the money was all gone. They had a public relations disaster on their hands. And that's why, in November 1827, Brunel's son, Isambard, organised a fundraising party. And it's quite famous. It's the world's first underwater dinner party. And if you see pictures of it, there are long tables um, covered in white damask, there are red drapes, there are very fancy portable gas candelabra. If you look closely at the picture, you can just make out the, the glint of the instruments of the band of the Coldstream Guards who played for them whilst they were dining under the River Thames. So, to be clear, this is, this is not a celebration because they've finished. This is a fundraising event. As a piece of public relations, of course, it's inspired. And if it's, if it's safe enough to have a dinner party in the tunnel, then it's clearly safe enough for you or others as, uh, as funders, as shareholders, to take up a second subscription and give the Brunels the money to continue the works. And that's what happened. They had money and renewed public confidence, and the work began again. Sadly, 11 weeks after the flood, the first flood, 11 weeks after there was another terrible flood and six men lost their lives. After the second flood, the whole project went silent because, you know, you can, you can only invite people to a dinner party in a recently flooded but now completely safe tunnel once. And the second time, everyone's diary is busy and nobody wants to risk it. So they, they had nowhere to go, they had no money, there was no public confidence. And for seven years, for seven years, the whole project was mothballed. But Mark still had that fighting spirit. He was not going to give up on his tunnel. For seven years, the Brunels made a huge effort to fundraise and gain support with public events and lobbying. The Duke of Wellington, a supporter of the Brunels, who attended Isambard's underwater banquet, was now Prime Minister. And together with Mark and a group of influential friends, they convinced the government to put up the money for the completion of the tunnel. Now age 65, tunnelling finally recommenced on Mark Brunel's dream. Again there were problems, but the tunnel reached Wapping on the north bank of the Thames in 1841, finally opening to the public in 1843, and it was a triumph. It opened with fanfare and with procession. And Mark Brunel, who is now 74 years old, he's, um, he's venerable. That's a good age. That's a good age then, especially. And uh, the, the public have now taken him to their hearts. Uh, he's uh, the toast of the town. And uh, proud, he leads a procession on the opening day from Rotherhithe to Wapping. And Queen Victoria comes here and he is knighted, Mark Brunel is knighted uh, for, his, for his wonderful tunnel under the River Thames. This is the grand entrance hall to the eighth wonder of the world. That's what the Victorians called it. When it opened, 
there were 50,000 visitors on the first day. On the first day, there were 50,000 visitors. By the end of the 15th week, there were a million visitors. Now, that's quite a lot of people, but in 1843, a million people is half the population of London. This was a huge visitor attraction, a huge draw, and people came from all over the world here to descend this staircase into the tunnels beneath our feet. And here, do you see, is the line of the original staircase. You can see the girders which held the stairs, and here you can see the stanchions for the handrails. The people come down the staircase uh, into the tunnel below and they would walk in this direction uh, in a, a, a vaulted passageway passing stores, stalls, um, alcoves where there were entertainments. This is actually the entrance hall to the world's first underwater fairground. And this chamber would have been packed with people, with tourists, with holidaymakers, with fun seekers, with revelers. This is a party space. There were sword swallowers, fire eaters, magicians, uh, Ethiopian serenaders, Indian dancers, Chinese singers. Uh, a whole section of the tunnel was, was decked out as a ballroom. There were places to romance, places to dance. This is a party venue. There are uh, female acrobats that are performing horses. There are sword swallowers. There are magicians. There's, um, there's sex. There's drugs. There isn't rock and roll, but there is ballroom dancing. This is the site of a 19th century rave. So, the tunnel was a huge success for Victorian London, except it wasn't. Financially, it was a disaster. The money the tourists paid was nowhere near enough to cover costs. Although it was the greatest engineering feat of its day, in monetary terms, it was a failure. The Thames Tunnel Company may have opened the tunnel to the public with much pomp and circumstance, but it wasn't actually finished. They'd run out of money before building the cargo ramps in which to get the cargo down the tunnel in order to transport it to the other side, the whole point of the tunnel when the idea was first conceived. It's actually, in terms of business, it's a nonsense. It's like, uh, it's like funding an airport, but not paying for any aeroplanes. Uh, so this is a cargo tunnel that can't take cargo because the huge ramps to get the cargo down, they aren't built. Despite the tunnel company's best efforts, the fairground was never enough to make the tunnel financially viable and it was eventually sold to the railway and incorporated into the rail network. In 1869, steam trains passed under a river for the first time in history and the tunnel remains in use to this day, over 160 years later as part of the rail network. The method used to dig under the Thames was revolutionary and influenced the way tunnels were constructed from then on, not just for London and the UK, but for the rest of the world. The Channel Tunnel, linking Brunel's country of birth with his country of adoption, was built using an adapted version of the tunnelling shield. But for London particularly, Mark Brunel's revolutionary method of tunnelling paved the way for the London Underground, as the tube went on to be constructed using Brunel's design shortly after his death in 1849. This was a metro system so successful that it was copied the world over. Without the Frenchman Marc Brunel, the London Underground would simply not have been built. It's now the oldest tunnel in the oldest metro system in the world. A network of tunnels moving people in and out from their workplaces. And if it weren't for that, then London would not be a world city. If it weren't for that, then the conditions that we all live in, in this great city, would be extremely unpleasant. So the debt is enormous. The debt is enormous. The Brunel legacy lived on through Mark's son, Isambard, one of the greatest Britons who ever lived. But it's his father, the Frenchman, Mark Brunel, who left a permanent mark on the city of London as we know it today. Every refugee brings to London a skill. And, uh, and every refugee comes here um, 
ready to, uh, to give to this city and to take opportunities. But it's hard to think of anyone who has more radically altered the lives of Londoners and all city dwellers than Mark Brunel. Thank you.